Well, open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter number 7 and just break your finger off there for a bookmark and then turn over to Galatians chapter number 6. Read a couple passages of Scripture. Read one verse in Matthew, Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 12. We used uh, this as a starting place last week or I guess the week before. Matthew chapter 7, verse number 12. We're preaching tonight on what every spouse needs. This is the second part. And uh, actually we split the first sermon up into two parts, but it was act- both those parts were one part. Everything clear now? <laughs> first part, part, first part was in two parts, but we're calling it one part. This is part two. What every spouse needs. I wish every... I wish every uh, prospective bride and groom would take time to study uh, marriage and find out what they can do to be the best husband or wife that they can possibly be. I think everybody in here would agree with me that marriages are suffering today. Families are suffering. It's uh, our whole our whole nation is suffering because families have broken down and if the family's not going well church won't nation won't nothing goes well if the family's broken down and so uh, that's the reason for this series of messages in Matthew chapter number 7 and verse number 12 we'll read this one verse and then go to Galatians therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you do ye even so to them for this is the law and the prophets. Now we said that this is not a verse that, a, that in context applies, uh, that is teaching about the marriage relationship, but the underlying principle applies to every relationship. In other words, we need to treat other people the way we'd want to be treated. Isn't that what it says? We need to treat other people the way we want to be treated. Now the Bible talks about in another place that we ought to do good to all men, but especially unto those that are of the household of faith. So that narrows it down. We ought to be especially good to people that's in our church, and then when we get it, narrow it down even more into our family and to the marriage relationship, we ought to be even more especially on target to make that other person feel like they're being treated just like we'd like to be treated. Now go over to Galatians chapter number uh, 6. Galatians chapter number 6 and we'll take another general principle and apply it to the marriage relationship in verse number 7 we're in chapter 6 verse number 7 be not deceived God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap now in a husband wife relationship if you plant good marriage seeds, they'll sprout. If you plant hatefulness, bitterness, sarcasm, selfishness, neglect, refusal to obey the Word of God, then what are you going to reap? You're going to reap in kind. True? Nod your head up and down. I'm, uh, sometimes I'm, I feel like I'm suffering up here. I know you're probably just thinking... But it lets me know you're awake and I'm, I'm making contact. If you let me know it every once in a while, ladies wave a hanky. Men say amen. You know, stand up and run around the room. Jump in the baptistry if you have to, but let me know you're awake. <laughs> now go to verse, verse 8. For he that soweth to his flesh. Now what would we call that? Selfishness. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, rottenness. What kind of marriage are you going to have if you have a selfish marriage? You're going to have a rotten marriage. <laughs> but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life, ever, life everlasting and reap a good marriage everlasting. And uh, Tim LaHaye wrote a book back seven, or several years ago, decades ago, and it was called The Spirit-Filled Family, or The Spirit-Controlled, I'm sorry, The Spirit-Controlled Family. I've had a couple of copies of it in my libraries over the years and gave a copy or two away. 
And uh, that whole book, the premise is, if, if the man is saved and filled with the Spirit of God, and the woman is saved and filled with the Spirit of God, then they're going to have a Spirit-controlled family. The children will sense that security and that heavenliness in the marriage, and that marriage will be good. Are you with me? Spirit-filled family. Now let's go to verse 9. And let us not be weary in well-doing. Uh-oh. <laughs> you remember what you did to make that other person like you before you got married? You weren't weary and well-doing then. I mean, you run over yourself trying to make her like you, make her notice you. You'd uh, run over yourself trying to make conversation. You'd spend hours on that stupid telephone and, uh, and talking about stuff that didn't amount to a hill of beans except you were trying to make the other person like you, right? You know what I'm talking about. And uh, he says here, let us not be weary in well-doing. If you did it before you got married, keep on doing it. Whatever you did to get her, whatever you did to get him, keep on doing it. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. And so the idea here is keep on doing what's good in your marriage. That's the application. That's not the primary in interpretation, but it is the application that applies to all of our endeavors. And then verse 10. As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Father, I pray that you'd bless us. Lord, help us to have good marriages in this church. Lord, help us to exemplify to those around us, our children, our grandchildren, our friends, and the people that we barely know. Help us to demonstrate to them what a good marriage ought to be, a godly marriage, a spirit-filled marriage. Lord, help us to enjoy our marriage relationship. And Lord, I pray for those relationships that might be strained right now. And Lord, it is a strain, and it is a heartbreak. And none of us have perfect marriages. And maybe a lot of them are not near as good as they look on the surface. But Lord, we want to have good marriages. And I pray for every strained marriage and every marriage that's endeavoring to be better. I pray that you'd give us the unction of the Holy Spirit of God. That that's exactly what would happen. That we'd work at it and we'd yield to you along the way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What every spouse needs. We have needs. <laughs> Men have needs. Women have needs. And uh, so we... Let me just... By way of just a very minuscule review, we, we've asked this question in the past, why do we need to learn and understand and appreciate one another's needs? Men have needs, women have needs. So why bother to study and learn about it? Uh, well, first, because you have an obligation to do so. God says that we ought to make our marriage as well. They ought to be good. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, obey your husbands. Show him reverence. And uh, so we have an obligation. Second, if you don't take care of that relationship and show how those needs can be met and endeavor to meet those needs, if you don't do it, somebody else might. Now that doesn't justify adultery. That doesn't uh, justify a breakup or a split up. It doesn't justify the guilty party at all but it does explain why some of them happen. And the devil's out to destroy your marriage. I'm just going to tell you up front. The devil wants to destroy your marriage. And uh, you're a threat to him. A good, strong family is a threat to the devil. And so he's going to try to attack, and your job's to remove the temptation, meet each other's needs. And uh, all of us are vulnerable to temptation. Everybody in here is liable likely even at times to fall into some sort of temptation and so we need to strengthen our marriages so we don't fail to meet their needs now why do husbands and wives sometimes fail to meet their spouse's needs we, we went over this a little bit before how does that happen why do we fail we mentioned two words on the, in our last message selfish selfishness and ignorance One's a head problem, the other's a heart problem. Uh, one is uh, a problem that has to be solved by 
increasing knowledge, and the other, the, <coughs> the heart problem has to be solved by repentance. Just when, when somebody says, I don't care about the other person's needs, I'm not going to bother myself with it, then that, that's a selfishness problem. And that only is going to be helped, it's only going to be solved by plain old downright repentance and saying, God's right, I'm wrong, I need to fix this. Women, women and men have similar needs, but they rank them differently. And uh, here's the way, it's on your outline there, here's the five top needs that were identified uh, of men and women. For men, we have the physical fulfillment, recreational companionship, an attractive spouse, domestic support, and... Uh, Admiration. That's what the men say their five top needs are. And women say, number one is affection. Number two, conversation. Number three, honesty and openness. Number four, financial support. And number five, family commitment. And so we addressed the first two of these in the previous messages. And we're going to take them side by side. Man, number one. Woman, number one. We did that last. And uh, now tonight we're going to Talk about man's number two need and woman's number two need. Now, again, these are very general and do not hold exactly true in everybody's life, all right? But they are generally true. And uh, so tonight we're going to talk about, first of all, the woman's greatest need. What is it? It's affection. And, uh, or the, I'm sorry, we talked about that last week. And uh, to a woman, affection represents security, protection, comfort, and approval. Women need that. And then the husband's greatest need was that physical fulfillment, the romantic desire. And uh, every man ought to be able to be satisfied completely in that marriage with the physical relationship. Uh, Philippians 2.4 is a verse we used uh, last, and it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. And uh, that means that we're to be concerned about some, some things outside of ourselves, not just what we're interested in, but what she's interested in, or why she's supposed to be interested in what he's interested in. And we're, we're to be interested in fulfilling one another's needs. Everybody on board? All right, here we go. New information for tonight. Number, well, we're going to say number one, the woman's second greatest need is conversation. The woman's second greatest need is conversation. The first one was affection. Now we're on conversation. Unlike the need for sexual fulfillment, the, this need can be met outside the marriage, but it should be met inside the marriage as well. And our need for conversation can be ethically met by most anyone, but certainly it needs to be met in the marriage. Uh, since <coughs> this is one of our most important emotional needs, it's worth thinking about. It's worth talking about. And it's crucial to your marital happiness. If we don't learn to talk, if we don't learn to communicate, we will disintegrate. And so communication, talking, uh, this need for conversation uh, is just, it's not met completely by just simply talking, but it's communicating when it's enjoyable to both. That goes in your blank. It's enjoyable to both. No, you don't have a blank on that, or do you? Do you have a blank on that? Okay. Uh, it is to be enjoyable, or it doesn't meet the need. It's supposed to be both people involved. Mothers uh, often talk to their children all day. They've got little toddlers, and they're talking to them and, and carrying on conversation, talking uh, on their level. And so uh, a stay-at-home mom may be talking to those kids all day long. And so when Dad comes home... Uh, she needs some adult level conversation, right? And so she needs to talk to somebody on that level. And uh, sometimes people, I hope you talk to your kids. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling you, in, in our families today, there is, a, there is a dearth of teaching, training, and communicating with kids because the families are oftentimes off on their own excursions, doing their own thing, and not, not talking and communicating with the kids like they used to. I remember as a little kid being at home. I remember even when we had company. Uh, there wasn't a lot of television back then, and uh, we had an old TV, but we got Channel 4 and Channel 11, and uh, when we got TV, <laughs> and when we got a signal, and it had an antenna on top of the roof, and uh, 
and a lot of the times it was so snowy and staticky you couldn't see the picture and uh, so there wasn't a whole lot of TV watching but people still visited one another and sat around in the house and they would, uh, they'd talk there'd be another family come over uh, I remember when uh, uh, Mr. Sanders that ran the old Gid store uh, just can barely remember this he and his wife came over one night and they were visiting at our house and they were sitting on the on the sofa and uh, mom and dad were sitting on the other side of the room and and uh, the end of that old sofa had a torn place the where the upholstery came up the side of it and the arm kind of curled over like that and that upholstery was loose we had a pet squirrel named Bimbo and uh, no fox squirrel we got that squirrel when it was just a little baby and, uh, and that squirrel at night time would go and crawl up there and go down in behind that uh, uh, fabric on that sofa and that was his den down in there and that's where he'd sleep at night and for some reason that night Mrs. Sanders was sitting right beside that arm of that sofa and Mr. Sanders was sitting over there and they're sitting there carrying on conversation everything's real pleasant and lovely and for some reason the squirrel decided to come out and get in on the conversation he come out and he stuck his head up out of that little hollow place in that couch he looked at Mrs. Sanders right in the eye and ran across her lap onto Mr. Sanders' lap and off on the floor. The woman had to go home and change clothes right after that. We used to communicate. We used to talk. We used to have, I remember sitting at Dad's feet and I'd hear him tell those war stories. I've heard him talk about when he was in North Africa and uh, France and Italy during World War II and I've heard him tell so many stories and I'd heard a lot of them more than once, but they were always interesting to hear again. He put himself into it when he told those stories. And, uh, and, and so there's communication going on. And, and kids would usually sit quietly and listen to the adults talk. And so we learned some wisdom and communication skills from the adults. But today, people don't visit much anymore. People are busy. And when Dad gets home, uh, a lot of times the conversation goes like this. Come through the door, where's the remote? <laughs> and goes and sits down, and that's it. Kids start to say something, hey, quiet over there, I'm watching the news. And, uh, and, and there's not a lot of communication going on in the family. Now, if your family, it is going on, thank God for it. It ought to be going on in every family. But we're, we're losing out on the conversation. And uh, mom needs some good conversation from dad when he comes home. Good, character, good conversation is characterized by the following. Look at your outline. Good conversation is characterized by the following. Number one, using it to inform and investigate each other. Now, this is just the, the basics here. This is the basics of conversation. I'm talking about you're just exchanging information. You're giving out some information, and you're asking maybe some questions and gaining some information. How'd your day go? Uh, okay. Boss is kind of cranky. How'd your day go? Yeah, pretty good. Kids got in a fight. <laughs> and so you're just exchanging some information. You know, <laughs> sometimes if you don't hone those conversation skills in the home, it can be just kind of a limited conversation. Dad gets up in the morning, walks in the, in the kitchen, and Mom says, Want breakfast? Guess so. Eggs? Yeah. Scrambled? Okay. Coffee? Might as well. <laughs> that's, about as, that's about as far as it goes. I mean, you're exchanging a little information, but there's not a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of uh, enthusiasm and not a whole lot of adjectives going along with this, you know. We're communicating, but on the simplest form. I counseled a, a man and a woman. Well, let me take this back. I counseled a man in Denver. <laughs> he told me that he wanted me to come and talk to his wife. And I said, well, what about? And he said, well, we don't talk. I said, well, she, maybe she's just shy. He said, no, I mean she don't talk. I said, uh, you mean she's just a woman of very few words? He said, no, I mean she does not talk. I said, you mean like she doesn't answer you or say anything when you say something? He said, that's right. She says nothing. I said, well, how do you uh, get around uh, things like taking care of the kids. I had the house full of kids. I said, how do you get around taking care of the kids? He said, she writes me notes. I said, you're pulling my leg, aren't you? He said, no, sir. He said, that's why I need you to come and talk to her. 
I said, you really saying she never talks to you? Or is this just when she's mad? He said, no, no, she's not mad at all. She just doesn't talk to me. I said, is she capable of talking? He said, oh, yeah. He said, there's been a time or two that she said a few words, but she just won't talk. I said, this, you two live in the same house? He said, yeah. He said, when I get up and go to work in the morning, he said, she'll, uh, when I'm getting ready to go to work, he said, she'll write a note and lay it on my pillow, tell me where my lunch is at and any instructions. If she needs me to pick something up at the grocery store, she writes me a note and lays it on my pillow. I said, you don't talk. He said, that's right. I said, how did you two ever have kids? <laughs> I went to their house. I said, I don't know how this is going to work. If she won't talk to you, why do you think she'll talk to me? He said, I don't know. You're the preacher. <laughs> so we got there, and, uh, and we walked in, and I said, uh, well, where is she? He said, well, she's in the bedroom. And he said, uh, I'd like for you to go in there and talk to her. I said, no, wait a minute. <laughs> this is not... Uh, that's not the way I intend to do this. He said, well, I'll go with you and everything. I said, is everything okay? She's, she's decent. I said, she's not in bed. He said, no, she's just laying on the bed. He said, go in and talk to her. He said, I'll go in with you. So we walked through the door, and when I walked through the door, she saw my face, and she rolled over and faced the wall and would not talk to me. And uh, so I had a conversation. Well, no, I had a monologue. <laughs> I talked for about 15 minutes and I went through the plan of salvation with her and I got a nod at one place and that was about it and that was the end of it I was never able to help that couple to gain any kind of communication you say what happened I don't know I moved to Arkansas after that and never did have contact with them anymore but it had been going on that way between them for years now that's an extreme example but I'm saying, if about all we do is just change a few, exchange a few words and we don't, we don't put ourselves into it emotionally, then there's not much conversation. It's not much better than what they had by writing notes in Denver. Number two, focusing attention on topics of mutual interest. Focusing attention on topics of mutual interest. Now, what are we talking about here? We're talking about in a marriage where we have a conversation going on, and it's not just one person doing the talking. It's both people talking and exchanging ideas, and, uh, and both people will need to talk about some things that have some mutual interest in it. So that means a, a lady who is married to a a husband is going to need to understand a few things about him. You've got to learn what makes him tick. And, and he's got to learn what makes her tick. And find out what interests each other. And talk about those things. And if you're not interested in one thing, find something else that you can have a mutual understanding about. A mutual interest in. And uh, my wife, once in a while, she likes to hear about my beekeeping. <laughs> and so I'll tell her. How my beekeeping's going. And sometimes I tell her more than she wanted to know. <laughs> I can talk about bees for hours. I've, uh, I've read books all my life about honeybees, and I can, uh, I can tell a lot of stuff about honeybees, but she doesn't want to know all that. She's, it's kind of like when I preach. She said, honey, uh, she said, I know you study hard, and you, uh, and you have a lot to say when you preach, but she said, you've got to understand, we don't want all of it at one time. <laughs> <laughs> she smiles when she says that so I let her do the outline tonight and she cut the men's section really short <laughs> I had a couple of guys belly aching before the service even started tonight about the outline being short on the men's side I said look women already know how to talk they don't need any much instruction here <laughs> now when I was a kid growing up my mom and dad they had plenty of faults, but one thing they knew how to do was carry on a conversation, and they talked. I can remember sitting at the breakfast table, and Dad was a carpenter, among other things, and he'd be telling Mom before he went to work, he'd be telling, he called her Mom, because that's what we kids call her. How many of, isn't that the proper name for, for the wife, Mom? Yeah, <laughs> so he called her Mom, and he'd say, Mom, you'll never guess what happened yesterday when we were putting up the rafters on that house down there. He said, man, this guy I had helping me, this young fella, he's, he was getting his finger between the rafter and the ridge pole every five minutes. He had every one of his five fingers on one hand bloodied up before we quit yesterday afternoon. 
and he'd talk about that and he'd laugh and tell her about it and, and she'd laugh. Of course, mom always enjoyed other people's in, injuries and <laughs> my mother's the only person that, uh, you know, she, she, she looked after us kids really well but she'd, uh, if, if we fell and hurt ourselves, she'd laugh for a minute or two before she took care of us. You know? <laughs> she thought it was kind of funny. <laughs> but they carried on a conversation. <laughs> they, uh, they talked, and, they, uh, and they, to they told about what happened during the day, and, and Mom was interested to hear it. She, she cherished my dad. My mama loved my daddy with all of her heart, and, uh, and uh, she loved to hear anything that he was telling about and talking about. She could just listen to him for hours and dad was not uh, like the typical man who won't talk to his wife dad talked quite a bit he, he loved to talk and, and uh, he'd tell her uh, you know he'd say you know uh, mom you should have you should have seen the time he was a cook in the uh, artillery unit in World War II and he said uh, my dad called them Arabs the people we call Arabs <laughs> they were Arabs to dad and uh, he said mom you should have been there he said we well, was cooking one day and he said, we noticed some of, our, some of our rations had come up missing and for several days in a row. And he said, we had this, uh, had this Arab help, helping us around the kitchen. And he said, the day came when we, uh, when we, we were busy cooking and we saw him uh, slipping some of the food out and he was stealing our food. And so we threatened to shoot him and he took off running. And he said, you should have seen him going down through that sand, running across the desert and his old floppy britches going back and forth. And we were shooting right beside of him as he was running. And he was dodging those bullets. And, and Dad would get into it. And he's really telling Mom all about that. And she, she loved, she'd heard that story ten times, I know. But she'd laugh every time. And they'd, and they'd talk. And, and she'd tell him, Dad, I, I think I need a, a set of cabinets. We're just too cramped in this little kitchen. And uh, they'd sit and talk about how they're going to design out the cabinets. And, He'd tell her every detail, and, and she'd tell him what she'd like to have, and, and they'd talk back and forth. They, they were good conversationalists with each other, and uh, I admire them for that. We need to learn in our families to have good-natured conversation and just talk. Number three, balancing the conversation so both have equal opportunity to talk. Now, men, you're going to see here why I've devoted most of this to the women right here. Balancing the conversation so both have equal opportunity to talk. It is a two-way street. And uh, have you ever talked to somebody? <laughs> have you ever talked to somebody that, that when they start, it's kind of like a motor running? <laughs> huh? And, uh, and there's no place. You keep trying to get in the conversation, <laughs> and, and you can't find a place to jump in. And, and, and you're, waiting, you're waiting, waiting for the opportunity to try to get your word in, and they keep going. I see embarrassment, and there's ribs being punched all over the room right now as I speak. <laughs> and sometimes uh, they're called motor mouth, <laughs> the mouth of the South. And so what happens sometimes if somebody has the habit of just talking continuously and don't stop in there somewhere. Now, I'm not just talking to ladies. I know guys that do this, too. I went to school with a guy by the name of Kenneth Fulbright. He's probably watching on live stream tonight. <laughs> this, this is the curse of being able to just really open up and preach your heart out. <laughs> Kenneth Fulbright in the sixth grade. I remember old Kenneth. He was the kind of guy, you know, he loved to talk. And, and, and people would try to get away from him. He'd be right in your face, and he's talking, you know, and he's spitting all the time he's talking. You know, kind of, must have been, a, been meant to be a preacher. And, uh, and so he's right in your face, you know, and he's talking and talking, and you, and you try to turn away. He'd get you by the shoulders and turn you back around and get in your face again. And uh, there was no place to get in and talk. And now, ladies and gentlemen, if you're going to have good marriage and good conversation in that marriage, there needs to be a stopping place every once in a while so the other person gets to talk a little. And uh, I know it's not polite to butt in. I, that's one of my pet peeves is to be talking and somebody butt in and stop right in the middle of it. But if you don't ever stop, you've got to understand why somebody might butt in once in a while. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So we, uh, we shouldn't be thinking about what we're going to say next but we should be willing to stop once in a while and encourage the other person to talk. It's not a one-way street. Good conversation is characterized by another action. 
Oh, let me let me say one thing I meant to say about uh, about the talking. Sometimes, if if it's a situation where mom's in the home and dad's working outside the home, uh, a lot of times because mom's been in the home all day with those kids or maybe alone, and uh, and she hasn't got her talking done yet, and dad comes through the door, and man, as soon as he gets half a step in the house, she's. Uh, like a dump truck, unloading all of it at once, and uh, you don't want to do that. Now, good conversation is characterized by number four, undivided attention while talking to each other. Now, why do we usually not have undivided attention? Sometimes people don't listen. <laughs> Sometimes we're thinking about what we're going to say next. I've talked to people like that, haven't you? Talk to people, you, you're talking to them, and you know good and well they're not hearing a word you say. They're just waiting for their turn to talk again. Now, it needs to be undivided attention. And this is where we, men, we do fail in this area probably more often than ladies do. Uh, giving attention, undivided attention. I have to admit, when I'm reading, study, I, I do a fair amount of studying at home and uh, because if, if I come to the church office and study, the phone rings all the time and people are coming in through the door and, and uh, so I get interruptions that way. If I try to study at home, my interruptions are limited to fewer people but they feel a little more <laughs> free to interrupt me. And so there's times when I'm reading or studying and uh, if my wife comes in to talk to me my mind is focused on what I'm looking at and it's easy for me to tune her out the, the sound of her voice is hitting my eardrums <laughs> but I'm not really hearing what she's saying and she knows it she knows it and she knows about you too Mr. Smug <laughs> your wife knows if you're really listening or not and so if my wife comes to talk to me the best thing for me to do is close it up and look her straight in the eye and listen to her she knows I'm listening make the eye contact lay aside what you're doing if you're still eyes still glued on the TV she knows you're not listening if your nose is still buried in the book she knows you're not listening she deserves your undivided attention now we feel we fail to meet the need for conversation when these things happen. Number one, when demands are made. That's on your outline. When demands are made. Uh, if we start trying to run the show and we start trying to really tell it like it is and how it's going to be and, and there's an immediate turn off in the conversation. When we, when we just come down hard and fast and say, now wait a minute, you're not gonna, you're not gonna, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, that kills the conversation, doesn't it? And we come across as being a tyrant and we fail to meet that need for conversation. Then number two, we fail to meet the need for conversation when dis disrespect is shown. When disrespect is shown. It's, uh, it's easy to become disrespectful to those we love the most. Funny little story. A woman was out of town visiting relatives. And she'd been gone for a couple of weeks, and so she called home. She asked her husband, how her beloved Siamese cat was. He hated cats. She said, how's, how's my cat? He said, he's dead. Man, she just hung up the phone. She went in her room and cried and cried and cried, and she didn't even call him back for a couple of days. And finally she called him back and she said, uh, I haven't felt like calling you. You really hurt my feelings. He said, why? Why? She said, well, you just told me my cat died. He said, well, it did die. She said, well, you didn't have to say it all at once that way. That's just harsh and, and crude. You should have done it differently. He said, well, how? She said, well, you could, have, you could have said when I asked about the cat, you could have said, well, he's playing on the roof. So he thought about that. He said, how would that help? She said, well, then the next day when we talk again on the phone, you could, have, you could say he fell off the roof. And then the third day, you could have called me back and said, uh, that cat's hurt pretty bad. And then the next day, you could have called me back and broke it to me more gently and said, well, you know, the 
cat got so sick he finally passed away. And he said, well, that sounds like craziness to me. She said, well, that, that would be the way to do it. She said, and by the way, I, I asked you to check on my, my mother too while I was gone, and I want to know how she's doing. He thought for a minute, and he said, she's playing on the roof. <laughs> So how do we show disrespect in conversation? How do, we kill, how do we kill conversations? We can do it with insults, name calling, sarcasm, bitter speech, yelling. Can I just tell you that yelling won't solve anything? When people are in an argument, the problem is not that they're going deaf. <laughs> There's a problem that needs to be solved, and the problem needs to be attacked, not the person. Hello? <laughs> Work on the problem. Don't insult the person. And then conversation also fails when one or both become angry. Angry. The Bible does say, Be ye angry and sin not. So that means a couple of things. Number one, it means that there are times when we're going to be angry. If you think, young people, if you think you're going to get married and you're going to have that perfect relationship where you never get mad, you are mistaken <laughs> you will have times when you get mad be ye angry and sin not so it tells us number one that there are times when you're going to be angry but number two it tells us that we can be angry without sinning and you don't have to sin just because you're mad but a lot of times the angrier we get the louder we get the meaner we get and, uh, and, and we end up in sin because of it we, uh, we take the bait we take the bait. When one person raises their voice, gets a little bit mean-spirited, if you act in kind, what's that going to generate? Similar response. And then it gets elevated. The Bible says, A soft answer turneth away wrath. Surprise the daylights out of them. When they get mad, don't get mad back. Just don't get mad back. How about that? Don't take the bait. Just surprise them with how cool you're going to be. And then they'll know once it comes to this point this time, then they'll know next time how it's going to be. And they won't have to get mad in the first place. Number four, conversation fails when it's used to dwell on mistakes of the past or present. Dwelling on the mistakes... When you get in an argument, ladies and gentlemen, do you ever bring up something that's happened before? <laughs> huh? Well, you don't have to raise your hand or even say amen. I know you do. <laughs> One man said, uh, when my wife and I, when we get in an argument, she gets historical. He said, you mean hysterical? He said, no, I mean historical. She brings up everything that ever happened. <laughs> um, deal with the present situation. Deal with the problem at hand. Don't go and dig up something that's happened. That's why the Bible says that God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why the Bible says that when we confess our sins, when we get saved, He buries our sins in the deepest part of the sea. He separates Himself from them as far as the east is from the west, and He remembers them no more. We need to act more like God. And when we forgive something, don't bring it up again. And that's where we fail. When we bring things like that up, what does that do? That lets the spouse know the next time that a problem arises, it's just going to be painful. So why even talk? Why even talk? I know what she's going to say. I know what he'll do. And so it just gets to where you say, you know, for us it's just easier to not talk. So I'll write him a note and lay it on his pillow. <laughs> huh? Just say. You just get to that point and you say, you know, it's, it's so painful to try to have a conversation with him or with her. I'm better off not to say anything. Kind of like the man and his wife that had the big argument. They were traveling. They got in a big argument. Man, they were going at each other, yelling and calling each other names. And finally, they just both clammed up. They're sold up. 
he's driving down the road, man, looking straight down the road, and he's mad, and she's sitting over there against the window, and she's mad. And they're not saying a word. Went miles and miles, not a word said. Finally, the man looked out the window on her side and passed the barnyard, and he saw some pigs and donkeys out there. He punched his wife. He said, relatives of yours? She said, yep, in-laws. Sometimes it's better not to talk, you know. <laughs> Unpleasant conversation fails to meet the emotional need. Unpleasant conversation tends to not meet the emotional need at the moment, and it hinders the progress for the future. Men and women don't have too much difficulty talking when they're courting, <laughs> when they're getting... Uh, Getting just to know each other. Why? They're wanting to find out all about each other. They're wanting to find out what it makes, what it takes to make the other one like them. And then after they get married, a lot of times, man, it just shuts down. And it's kind of like, uh, and, and, and again, it may be the men that do this more often than the women. They just get to where the men get where we don't talk and uh, things are unhappy and, uh, and just don't have a lot of conversation going on. And so it makes you wonder, how did he do all that talking before, during the courtship stage? Everything was fun. And everything was happy talk back then. So we know it wasn't impossible to begin with, and it shouldn't be impossible after we're married. Well, you ever had just a craving to talk to somebody? That's a deep emotional need, just to talk. Women have that need, just to talk to talk and then if you want to have a good marriage meet her need learn to talk be a conversationalist find out what she likes and out of those things that she likes surely you can find a few things that you like and then talk about it and go about it back and forth and have conversation one of the places where conversation used to take place that's not taking place much anymore is I blame it on McDonald's. It's the McDonald's syndrome. You know why? Because breakfast is at McDonald's. He runs out to McDonald's and gets breakfast instead of sitting at the table and carrying on a conversation. She's rushing off to go take the kids to school or go to work, and, and she grabs a cup of coffee on the way. And the kids are scurried out the door, maybe something put in their lunchbox to take with them, snack on the way, a Pop-Tart. And, uh, and they're gone. And we don't sit around the table. I'm telling you, one of the greatest assets you have in your home is your kitchen table. Take that kitchen table, and if you can't eat breakfast together, sometimes it's, it's not possible because of schedules. But there ought to be some time during the day or evening where you can gather around the table. And you gather around the table and you just talk. Turn the TV off. Turn the music off. Maybe play some low instrumental music, but just have all the other sounds to disappear and just talk. Talk as you eat, carry on a pleasant conversation. Now, I've been around homes before. I, I used to visit with some kids. We used to go home with one another from school once in a while, and I've been in a few homes where if the kids tried to talk uh, at the table, uh, either dad or mom would and say, hey, no talking at the table. Think, what's, what's up with this? <laughs> Ain't the way it is in my house. We talk at the table. <laughs> and we ought to have a good time talking at the table. That's a good time to break out your Bible and maybe use this to have some discussion. Maybe have some family devotion time and maybe have prayer time and have a time where the family's interchanging with each other. And mom and dad can do that and take charge. Dad, do it. Number two, big number two, the man's second greatest need, recreational companionship. There's things that, a men, that men like to do. Some men like to hunt, some like to fish, some like to ride four-wheelers, some like to keep bees, some like to golf, some men like to uh, do various things, maybe paintball or, you know, I, I, think there is a, I think there is a problem nowadays with a lot of young men. I know there's a lot of young men now that their recreation is a little electronic box and they're sitting there playing these games, you know, and, and uh, going crazy on that game and you can't get their nose out of it. This is a problem. And we ought not allow our kids to sit around with those things with their face in it all the time. Put a time limit on that if you're going to have them. And, uh, and, and 
People are not good conversationalists anymore and people don't have good recreation anymore because of too many electronics. Hey, they're, they're wonderful devices and they're good uh, for doing research and it's like having a library at your fingertips and uh, yeah, you're, there's social media and you can keep in contact with friends but if we're on it all the time it's going to destroy our families and we're giving all of our attention to other people out there in some kind of uh, uh, outer space where it should be given to our people in the home. And we need to talk and we need to have recreation together and men like to have recreation and they but something happens when uh, men and women get married. A lot of times the, they make the mistake of just going separate ways. That's on your outline. Going separate ways. Just going separate ways. She goes and does her thing. He goes and does his thing. She goes out maybe and plays golf with the girls and he goes fishing with the guys or whatever that recreation is. A man needs his wife to be his buddy, his pal, his friend and do things together. And, uh, and, and there might be some things that you don't particularly care for that, that she does and vice versa. And it wouldn't hurt us to do something once in a while that's not really our cup of tea. <laughs> Ladies, it wouldn't hurt you once in a while to do something with your husband it's not really all that much fun to you but you can do it old lady said <laughs> yeah, I didn't like that one see why I don't make the outline long enough for the women they don't cooperate brother Al <laughs> took my wife fishing I think I told you this a week or two ago I probably repeat myself a lot repeat myself a lot uh, <laughs> took my wife fishing up the creek she slipped and fell on those rocks and when we got back I asked her if she wanted to go again next week and she said no I won't ever go with you again <laughs> she did not like creek fishing I loved it but she didn't care for it I don't blame her for that I mean that was pretty rough and rugged snakes swimming through the water and snakes dropping off limbs on your shoulders and stuff like that I, I mean we men we like that I mean we grab one of the mo water moccasins and make a necktie out of it you know <laughs> <laughs> I don't blame her for not wanting to go fishing but there are things you can find to do together you don't have to have a lot of money to do it you can get a pound of bologna and a loaf of bread and go down to the park and sit at the park bench and have lunch together huh yeah, yeah. that can be fun you can, you can load in the car and go driving together and just go see some places you haven't seen before and you can do things together. You can find things you like. Find things that get both of your, uh, gets both of your interest connected. And a man needs a wife who can get involved with some of the things. Now, I'm not saying that she has to go deer hunting and, uh, and, and duck hunting I, for the life of me. I, I used to be a hunter and I used to love to hunt. I never did go duck hunting. I never could see standing out there in cold water and shivering for three or four hours to shoot three or four ducks. I know some people love it. That's okay if you love it. <laughs> Always had trouble just sitting on a deer stand for more than an hour and shivering in the cold. <laughs> I don't expect my wife to do that, but I can find some things that she likes to do. And so we go to Harbor Freight Tools. <laughs> well, find some things that you can get involved in together because a man needs his wife to be his buddy. You know, my wife is my best friend, and I tell her that pretty often. She is my best. She wasn't always my best friend. In our early years, she wasn't. I loved her, but there are certain things I just wanted to go and do with the guys. Way too much. But as we got older, I know I'm going to need her to take care of me or put me in a nursing home one of these days. <laughs> I, want her, I want her to be my friend, and we are friends. Now, there's times when it's good to get away from each other. There's times that you need a little bit of time away. But it ought not be the habit, and it ought not be that you like being with the guys more than you like being with your wife. And, uh, and ladies, if you want your husband to spend some time with you and be affectionate to you, which I know you do, 
then find something that interests you, that interests him, and get involved with him. Ladies, it's your job to supply your man's needs, and not only that physical need that we talked about last week, but the need for companionship in recreation to do things just for fun. Find out what makes him tick and say, hey, let's do this together and do it. And you do need a little time on your outline, a little time to get away, to divert daily. Have a little time where you get alone uh, away from your spouse. You don't have to be together 24 hours a day. You need a little bit of time where you can get off by yourself and just think and meditate on your own. W, withdraw weekly. Maybe there's a time each week where you want to do something for just a little while and, uh, and do it alone or maybe do it with somebody. It's not, wrong to have, it's not wrong for a man to have friends, male friends, where they go and, and hit some golf balls or uh, go, and, go four-wheeling and run through the, the mud and the brush and do things like that. And then A, abandon annually. Have a time where you can get away and just think things through. Spend a little time and have a day or two of, on your own. There's nothing wrong with that. But you better make your wife your buddy and wives you better find some things that you can do with your husband because our marriages need to stick together and that's the cement that's the glue that sticks us together and will keep us together let's pray together father bless the invitation time lord our marriages sometimes suffer because we don't try to meet each other's needs and men and women both have needs and lord i pray that you'd put a desire in us to say you know it's my responsibility to meet my spouse's needs. And as best I know how, making the decision tonight, that I'm going to quit being selfish. These messages are supplying some knowledge that I need to help with the ignorant, ignorance part of it, but now I need just the part that gets rid of the selfishness. And I say, I'm willing to make things work in our marriage. And I'm going to I'm going to make my wife at the top of my list. I'm going to make my husband at the top of the list. I pray that you'd bless us with godly families in this church. Lord, if there's someone who's not saved, I pray that tonight they'd say, Dear Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I don't deserve heaven, but I don't want to go to hell. I pray that you'd save me once for all forever this night. Lord, I pray that they'd pray that right now, here tonight. Bless the invitation, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Would you stand, please, as the piano plays? If you need to come and talk to the Lord, you can grab your husband, grab your wife, come to the altar, come by yourself. Maybe you're not even married yet, and you just need to make sure your heart is surrendered so you can be ready for that marriage. Dedication to the Lord comes first. altar.